set. It's six o'clock. In a minute's time, we all start. Okay. Yeah. Sure, sure. Jay, just be ready. We'll prompt you in a moment. Yes. Put sir. us live. So we are live. Six o'clock. Jay, just be ready. We'll prompt you in a moment. Yes, sir. Yes, Jay, sir. can you hear us? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Six o'clock. Varun, let us let us wait for another couple of minutes, two three minutes. Uh, I think uh, so the journey live. is going on. So we are already live. So Jay, or Mr. Varun Gadia, can you hear us? So we are already live. That's uh, we decided to go live at six o'clock. We are already live. We can begin. Uh, we can start because we are live now. Okay, okay, sir. Can we start? Good evening, all. I am Dr. Mayuraj Garur from JB Chemical Medical Team. I take this opportunity to welcome all for this webinar on perspective on ozonidipine, a different system. The treatment of hypertension is undergoing a paradigm shift with introduction of newer therapies and updating treatment guidelines. And on this background, we are here to know more about the topic. We are fortunate to have Professor Dr. Thomas Matthew as moderator for our event today. Before beginning the session, let me give a formal introduction. Professor Matthew is a renowned nephrologist in the country and currently working as a senior consultant nephrologist at the Baby Memorial Hospital, Calicut. Before this, he held office at Medical College, Calicut as professor and head of nephrology and also medical student. He has been honored with your awards to name few like his board and the best student of medicine. He received Lifetime Achievement Award in 2008 from the Association of Physicians of India, Best Doctor Award, Indian Medical Association Physical in 2009, and in 2010, he was awarded the prestigious Ibn Award, which was presented by former President APJ Abdul Kalam. In 2011, he received Mano Seva Award for Outstanding Contribution to the Society, He's not just been practicing medicine, but has imparted it as so. He's uh, also a very good teacher of over 30 years of experience in medical teaching for undergraduate and postgraduate students. Now I hand over the session to Professor Matthew and request him to introduce today's esteemed speaker. And after their session, we will have a question and answer. Questions can be asked in chat box. Uh, over to Professor Matthew. Dear friends, welcome to the webinar on perspectives in on azelnidipine, the calcium channel blocker with a difference. It's organized by Mr. JB Chemicals and Pharmaceuticals. And let me thank Mr. Varun and Mr. Sanjeev and their associates for making all the necessary arrangements. We have three very important, well-known speakers today. Dr. Dhiman Ahali from Calcutta is an eminent cardiologist known all over the country and abroad. A lot of experience in cardiac management, especially intervention cardiology. Followed by Dr. Sujay Ghosh, from, again from Calcutta. He gives his talks on the role of uh, acelnidipine on endocrinological disorders as well as diabetes. Is also an honored endocrinologist from Calcutta, known all over the country. And we have Dr. Chaurasia, an eminent neurologist from Varanasi, who will be talking to us on the post ischemic stroke and the role of uh, acelidipine in such situations. So, before uh, we start on these topics, I would like to say a few things about the uh, subject hypertension. Let me tell you a few facts. Hypertension is known to affect the human race from the time immemorial. It's the fourth important contributor of premature death in the world. Globally, almost 1.3 million billion people suffer from hypertension. 
As per the Indian guidelines reported in the JP in October 2019, uh, hypertension in adults of the age 18 and above is defined as a systolic BP of 140 millimeters of mercury or above and a diastolic BP of 90 millimeters or above. The prevalence in the urban areas in our country is 33.8% and in the rural areas it is 27.6% with an overall prevalence at 29.8%. The level of control of blood pressure achieved only in 20% in urban and 11% in the rural population. Ancient historical records as far as 2600 BC reports treatment for heart pulse disease. This was known as heart pulse disease in the past and the treatment were acupuncture, venesection, etc. The yellow emperor of China in 2600 BC and Galen as well as Hippocrates have all recommended venesection for the heart pulse disease known at that time. In 1913, the disease was called hypertensive vascular disease by Jane Way, and it was attributed to too much of salt in the blood and the blood vessels. In the early 20th century, Thomas Young, Richard Bright, and Cotungdon described the pathology of hypertension. The recognition of hypertension as a clinical entity came with the invention of Swigmo manometer by River Rocky in 1896 and the recognition of the Karakot sounds in 1905. Between 1910 and 1914, physicians made headway in defining both essential and malignant hypertension and the damage it caused to the target organs like the heart, brain, the kidneys, the eyes, and the blood vessels. So hypertension was considered as a disease of aging process than a disease which is curable or treatable till 1940s. The impact of untreated hypertension came into limelight after the death of President Franklin Roosevelt of the United States, who was president for four terms in 1945 at the time of the end of the World War II. His BP on that particular day after signing the treaty was 300 by 190 millimeters mercury. Roosevelt's death, the sudden death while his portrait was being painted, which left an incomplete un portrait, it highlighted the fact that till 1945, there were no effective antihypertensive drugs available. Non-pharmacological methods to treat hypertension at that time included strict salt restriction, Kempner's rice diet till 1940s, and injection of pyrogens, surgical methods like sympathectomy and adrenalectomy. You know, sodium thiocyanate was the first drug used in the treatment of hypertension by Tripol and Edinger in 1900. But it was toxic and became unpopular. Clinical sympathectomy with hexamazonium and tetraethyl ammonium was used in 1923, but found to be of no use. Guanethrine came into the picture in 1950, and thereafter hexamethonium, hydrolysine, and reserpine. The biggest step was the introduction of effective, orderly effective diuretic chlorothiazide by Freeze in 1957. Then in the 1960s, beta blockers were developed by James Black, who got the Nobel Prize for this great invention. Later, converting enzyme inhibitors came into the limelight in the 1980s. In the late 1980s, calcium channel blockers came into the market and it proved to be very effective in the treatment of hypertension. Now we have the third generation of calcium channel blocker, about which we are going to discuss today. And the third generation calcium channel blocker, acelnidipine, is 
very important because it is a highly lyophilic with inhibitory action of bo on both L and T types of calcium channels. And it produces persistent antihypertensive action. It has got anti-anginal action. It's an organ protective drug and has been shown to inhibit the tumor necrosis factor. And it can reduce the atherosclerotic plaque progression. All this has been proved from 2003 onwards because this drug was in the use in, in, the, in the regular use in, in Japan and other countries. And it has been proved that it, it is definitely good for the kidneys and the renal function might improve because both L and T the channels are blocked. The intraglomerular hypertension is controlled and the GFR improves. The proteinuria becomes less and the chronic kidney failure can be controlled to a certain effect. So it is a drug which is very good in controlling the blood pressure in the morning. There's no reflex tachycardia. It reduces pulse rate and the LV diastolic dysfunction improves. LV ejection factor improves. And there's an overall improvement in this human body in patients with severe hypertension. So it, it is said that in ischemic stroke patients, the safely it decreases the blood pressure systemic without decreasing the uh, cerebral blood flow. So with this in mind, let us hear from Dr. Dhiman, who is an eminent cardiologist from Kolkata to speak to us about the role of acetaminophen in cardiovascular disease. Dr. Dhiman, please. You need to unmute yourself, Dr. Kahali. You need to unmute yourself. Dr. Kahali, you can start. Dr. Kahali, we can't hear you. Yeah, I think now it's better. You'll have to be a bit louder, sir. We can't hear you. Sorry. Can you listen to me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Is it audible? Okay, thank you. Yes, Sorry you need to share your screen as well. Okay, sure. Thank you. So, thank you, Dr. Matthew, for your kind introduction. And good evening, uh, respected panelists speakers and the August audience. Now, this is the this is a new molecule, adulinidipin, which is a calcium blocker, as you heard from Professor Matthew, and which is a new one. And uh, these are the goals of uh, treatment, and this is the definition of hypertension till now. European Society and European Society of Hypertension tells if the pressure is more than 140 by 90, on the contrary, ACCH tells if it is more than 130 by 80 after being enlightened by the screen trial, which of course didn't include any diabetic patients. Now the BP goals are the same for both the societies and should be less than 130 by 80 millimeter mercury across the board. And definitions differ, but the global blood pressure is same. Now this is the recommendation by international society, optimal, less than 130 by 80, but individualized in the elderly based on frailty index. An essential reduced blood pressure by at least 20 to 10, 20 by 10 millimeter mercury. We should remember that even a very high blood pressure, just like I heard from Professor Matthew that in the Yale conference, there were three guys uh, signing the treaty, uh, President Roosevelt, who had a pressure like 300 by 190, and other two had almost similar blood pressure, Stalin and uh, uh, this Churchill, Winston Churchill. And uh, Stalin also died within a year or two after that conference and Roosevelt died soon. And they all died because of cerebral hemorrhage, all three of them. So there was no medicine, very good history by Professor Matthew. So we shouldn't go at a go and uh, we should go slowly. That's uh, we should reduce the blood pressure gradually and slowly, even if it is very high 
and ideally to below 140 by 90 and individualized in the elderly based on credit and optimal and essential aim for bp control within three months we have to reduce it we can take up to three months but we should control it and we should take it down to below 130 by 80 milliliter mercury and monitor for side effects as we know many of the molecules have side effects and also monitor adherence now if we uh, look at this slide ccvs have a strong position in the ASCHA and ASH guidelines and CCBs are recommended across many patient characteristics. Both CCB plus ARB or CCB plus ACEI are recommended for preferred lowering of blood pressure. Importantly, ASH considers that CCB plus ARB and CCB plus ACE combinations are superior to ACE plus diuretics or CCB plus diuretic combinations or ARB plus diuretic combinations in the high risk population. <clears throat> now, looking at this slide, you can see that uh, CCB cuts across all the parameters like the microalbuminuria, LVH, renal dysfunction, as he was mentioning, asymptomatic atherosclerosis, and this very useful drug in reducing the stroke MI, etc., etc. Of course, it doesn't improve the LV systolic function, so not a drug of choice, of course, in patients with reduced ejection fraction unless the patient has hypertension. Now, it is the preferred CCB for hypertension in terms of prevention of cardiovascular events. And this is the mechanism of action in short. It, uh, it's a calcium channel blocker and it slows heart rate a little, not much, and lower blood pressure. It acts on both L and T channel of the calcium channels and it slows heart rate by acting on the sinoatrial node which initiates heartbeat with electrical impulses. And this induces long-lasting vascular relaxation, this molecule, by inhibiting voltage-dependent L and T-type calcium channel in vascular smooth muscle and reduces heart rate by blocking T-type calcium channel in cardiac pacemaker cells. Uh, Agilinidipil blocks T-type calcium channel present on zona glomerulosa inhibits aldosterone synthesis and release. So it's an added mechanism of action. And I told about the SNO function. It also inhibits T-time calcium channel activation. It prolongs the late four phase depolarization as we can see over here. Now, this is a slide where you can see that some ambulatory BP monitoring study has been shown. And differences in blood pressure and pulse rate, if you look at it, being enlightened from these studies, you can see that uh, the difference between amlodipine and agilinidipine, that the systolic blood pressure is down by almost same diastolic blood pressure, though statistically not significant, a very little reduction uh, than amlodipine. And amlodipine also a very good molecule. We know about it. We have a large experience since 1986. And pulse rate is reduced by this molecule, which is the added feather of this molecule in comparison to amlodipine. Though amlodipine is told to be neutral, but various studies show that it increases the heart rate a little. And this difference is statistically significant, as you can see from this slide, 0 0.305 p time. And uh, nighttime BP is also affected in the same way by amlodipine and agilinidipine but the reduction is little more, though statistically not a very different. And both the drugs offer 24-hour BP reduction in this ambulatory study and have similar antihypertensive profile. Agilinidipine decreases pulse rate, amlodipine significantly, I shouldn't tell significantly, but it increases the pulse rate a little. There is no doubt about it. And this is a slide depicting the values. You can see that on the left-hand side, the systolic blood pressure is lowered almost equally. Uh, the agilinidipine has a little age over amlodipine in lowering the diastolic pressure, and the heart rate is a little lowered by this molecule. And you can see that there is a little bit of difference so far as the heart rate is concerned. And we want to reduce the heart rate. We want to keep the heart rate at the lowest because there is a linear relationship. As the heart rate goes up, the longevity also comes down because our heart has come to beat up to certain level. But if the heart rate per minute goes up, you know, the total uh, energy expenditure of the myocardium goes up and that's not good for the body. 
Agilinidip in probably elicits a persistent effect because it is retained in the vascular work. So it's very important that apart from the half-life, half-life wise, wise, you know, it has got a half-life of 18 to 24 hours, but uh, amlodipin has a higher half-life of 35 hours. And it shows hypotensive activity even after disappearance from the blood. So this molecule it stays in the vascular wall and there is some effect uh, even if the blood serum level of agilinidipine comes down. This is the effect of agilinidipine by self-measured morning and evening home blood pressure recording in the at-home study. This majority of the studies was performed in Japan to evaluate the sustained BP lowering effect of agilinidipine using mean morning and evening systolic blood pressure. It was almost a 4,900 patient study. And uh, morning hypertension, as we know, is a risk factor for cardiovascular and cerebrovascular events. And we know that the stroke incidences of stroke and MI are cascaded in the early hours of the morning from 3 a.m. to 8 or 9 a.m. because there is a surge of the neurohormones. And as a result, there is a increase of the blood pressure, which is being blunted by these molecules, which has got a uh, in, in, you know, increased half-life as agilinidipine or amlodipine. And agilinidipine was administered in study once daily in the morning. Regarding the timing of the antihypertensive, I think I should mention something at this point. Just to quote from Eugene Bronwell's latest book, which was of course written three years back, and that writes that all the antihypertensive agents should be given in the morning in empty stomach, and if somebody goes to washroom to pass urine in the early hours, say 4.30 or 5 o'clock, we should take the antihypertensive at that time. But after some meta-analysis data, you know, now we are recommending to give the antihypertensive medications during bedtime. Personally, I give it before dinner because if you give at bedtime, that's after dinner, there is some amount of antihypertensive activity loss because of admixture with food. So it's better, I think, if we take it just half an hour before the dinner, that's almost, and that will take care of the, uh, you know, uh, night surge of the blood pressure because in some deepers, normally we call it the deepers and non-deepers. So in majority of the patient, majority of us, the blood pressure dips, even if it is, we are not hypertensive and hypertensive is also deep. But patients who have got advanced hypertension, especially who have got target organ damage, their blood pressure don't go down uh, in the night. So it's very important to reduce their blood pressure, of course, taking care that they do not go too much down and cause cerebral or uh, ischemia in the myocardium. So in this study, you can see it was given in the morning. The clinic morning home and evening home measurements of systolic and diastolic pressures and pulses decreased significantly by week four. And these improvements were maintained for 16 weeks, and it was statistically significant. But the period of the study was very low, I should tell, only 16 weeks. So I need to, we need some randomized larger trial to establish this molecule. But however, the small studies which have been done, let us show all these things. And in the improvement in patient distribution, normal uh, morning blood pressure surged 2.8%. And you can see on the right-hand side, that normal BP increase was blunted and the sustained hypertension was controlled in this molecule even in the morning group. Significant reduction in home systolic and diastolic pressure and the low blood pressure lowering effect lasted till next day morning. Useful for patients with morning hypertension who are at high risk of cardiovascular events, especially stroke. So agile dipin and morning hypertension, this was an article by Japanese people. This shows the inhibitory effects of agilinidipin tablets on the morning surge with 5,500 almost patients. An objective was to determine the blood pressure and pulse rate lowering effects of agilinidipin administered once daily in the morning. And we can see that the change in blood pressure is fascinating, like amlodipin, and change in heart rate was something additive and which is in contradistinction to amlodipin's effect on the heart rate. So it offered significant reduction in morning blood pressure and also was advantageous from the heart rate perspective. Now, agilidipin and amlodipin, a comparison of their effects in clinical trials. This is a Chinese trial, very small number of patients, as I was telling, only 220 patients. 
treatment with adrenogenin 8 or 16 and amlo 2.5 or 5 milligrams. You can see that the reduction of blood pressure is almost same in both the uh, populations and uh, all the parameters are same except for the changes in the pulse rate. This is another study with adrenogenin plus olmisartan just to uh, update ourselves that olmisartan has been banned in France and adjacent West European countries for the last three years since August 2017. But of course, it has the approval of US FDA and it's also approved by our DCGI because of some uh, you know, dispute over the mortality figures, France and adjacent countries have banned it long back three years back. However, this study combined with agilinidipine, olmisartan or amlodipine on central blood pressure and LV mass index in hypertensive patients was tested. So this is an echocardiograph uh, added study. Patients with uh, systolic blood pressure more than 140 and diastolic pressure more than 90 received only certain monotherapy one group, 20 mg only for 12 weeks. And the patients were then randomly assigned to fixed dose add-on therapy with adrenaline or amlodipine for a part that 24 weeks. And the central aortic blood pressure, you know, we are measuring central blood pressure sometimes routinely, and LB mass index were measured at baseline and at the end of the study. What we got, central blood pressure is most, most strongly related to vascular hypertrophy, extent of atherosclerosis, and cardiovascular events than was brachial disease. And just I want to mention that beta blockers are not in favor because of their effects. They are a poor central aortic blood pressure lowering agents. The reduction in blood pressure in the peripheral, like the brachial artery and the central aorta, are not similar with the beta blockers. That is one of the reasons why it has been outdated and this has been degraded as a ideal antihypertensive agents. Of course, beta blockers has got some indications in hypertension, but that's another story. A 24-week perspective randomized open-level parallel study, and you can see that uh, one group received adrenaline 16, other amlodipine 5 milligram, very small number of patients again, and effects of only certain combined with either Agilinidipine or amlodipine evaluated the CBP and L ventricular mass index, left ventricular mass index. The decrease in brachial pressure was similar in both groups. CBP, the central blood pressure, central aortic pressure, and LP mass index decreased significantly in both the groups, and it was statistically significant. However, the decreases in CBP and LVMI were significantly greater with olmisartan plus agilinidipine group than it is with amlodipine group and it was statistically significant and as the slide depicts that there was a significant difference between the two groups so it's important that the molecule should reduce the central aortic pressure as well and the combination of olmisartan and agilinidipine had greater effects on central blood pressure and lv mass index than did olmisartan plus amlodipine this differential effects on cbp and LP mass index may have important implications for cardiovascular risk reduction. So we need more larger study randomized trials. The impact of adrenaline on LP diastolic performance, this is another study, CalBlock study, where a first line therapy with six milligram per day against small number of patients and amlodipine switched to adrenaline 16 milligram per day, early diastolic mitral anidas velocity ratio of peaky velocity to EDAS velocity, that's the diastolic parameters, and also they looked at the uh, uh, BNP or NT free uh, BNP. And this is the first line in adrenaline group, systolic and diastolic pressure were down, temporal changes in hemodynamic lab and echo parameters, first line adrenaline group, you can see that all the parameters were reduced significantly and which were statistically significant and heart rate response was good this study there was an average three per uh, minute reduction in the heart rate which is advantageous for us and we can see that the, the diastolic properties were improved so it has got significant effect on diastolic dysfunction and larger studies can show that whether it's a drug uh, it can become a drug of choice in patients with uh, you know, heart failure with reserve ejection fraction. So global longitudinal straightness is another pattern in the echo which we see 
and this was improved by three months of treatment and further regression of left ventricular hypertrophy was observed as depicted in this uh, slide by this group of uh, trialists. So there are some cardioprotective action of this molecule and it has been reported that it's not only lowers blood pressure with the additional use of adrenaline, there is associated improvements in some other LP diastolic performance parameters like increase in the E velocity, a reduction in LV feeling pressure because we are always bothered about the LV feeling pressure. We see that many of the patients have got an intact LV systolic function, but if you put a pigtail catheter inside the left ventricle, you find the LV deep is 40. And we are really afraid of this patient. The surgeon also doesn't want to operate on this patient. So this molecule is found to be little advantageous in patients with LV diastolic dysfunction. And a decrease in the BNP level in patients with hypertension and preserved systolic function. So that's a good indicator, and we did uh, larger studies to uh, substantiate this uh, finding. Among patients in whom amlodipine was switched to agilinidipine, BP and heart rate decreased significantly, and those reductions were associated with an increase in the E velocity. Therefore, regression of LVMI may be related to the improvement of LV diastolic function by these molecules. Uh, to conclude, lowering BP with additional agilinidipine is associated with improvement in LV diastolic performance, reduction in LV mass, and reduction in LV feeling pressure, reduction in BNP level in patients with hypertension with preserved systolic function. These are the effects of agilinidipine on reflex tachycardia, and as we told, there is no insignificant but some amount of reduction in the heart rate, which is advantageous for us. This is the day-by-day -day BP variability reported in this j study with again small number of patients and they were randomly assigned to hydrochlorothiazide or agilinidipine for 24 weeks and home BP was taken in the morning and evening. Arterial steepness was assessed by aortic transport velocity. Now effect day-by-day you can see the reductions in home systolic BP were similar between the two groups whereas the Standard deviation of home systolic decreases more in the agilinidipine group than in the hydrochlorothiazide group of patients. And excess aldosterone has a detrimental effect on a large artery stiffness. We know about this. Plasma aldosterone concentration in the hydrochlorothiazide group increased more than that in the agilinidipine group because I told at the outset it has got some anti aldosterone effect. Aortic pulse wave velocity and mean arterial pressure in the agilinidipine group decreased more than those in the hydrochlorothiazide group. The present study demonstrated that the addition of CCB to ARB decreased the day-to-day -day home BP variability more effectively than did the addition of a diuretic to ARB, whereas the reductions in home BP level were similar in both the regions. They are claimed to be has some anti-atherosclerotic effect like the amlodipine. This is one of the studies, ALT-J, which demonstrated that this molecule was not inferior to amlodipine for primary efficacy, that is BP reduction, in addition to standard medical therapy, including lipid lowering therapy and BP control, the diphyrohydropyridine CCB resulted in retardation of PV progression in hypertension. This is another Japanese study by called as a result study, and this is a double blind study randomized on the combination of olmisartan agilinidipine exerts a potent antihypertensive effect without reflex tachycardia. Thus, combination therapy with O plus A is well tolerated and considered safe. This combination was well tolerated in patients with essential hypertension, and the antihypertensive effect was greater than that of either of them as monotherapy. This ARB CCB combination of olmisartan agilinidipine could be a useful treatment option for this group of patients. This is another trial. You can see all the trials are from Japan. Oscar trial with uh, only 1,164 patients. Irish Japanese patients with uncontrolled hypertension. Systolic more than 140, diastolic more than 90 on standard dose monotherapy. But this is not a group with uncontrolled disease pressure. It's not very high. Cerebrovascular disease, cardiac disease, vascular disease are tied to diabetes mellitus. Randomized to high dose early certain 40 or standard dose calcium blocker and lidipine or agilinidipine with 20 milligram per day only certain. So in one group, high dose only and another group combination of CCB plus ARB. 
Adding other antihypertensive drugs was allowed if the BP was found to be very high. To summarize this trial, in the OSCAR trial, BP was significantly lower in the ARB plus CCB group than in the high-dose ARB group. There were no significant differences in primary endpoint rate between the high-dose ARB and the ARB plus CCB groups. In subgroup of patients with history of CB disease, primary composite endpoint was significantly higher in the high-dose ARB group than ARB plus CCB group, and this was statistically significant. Conversely, in the subgroup of patients with diabetes, but with no other comorbid conditions, the rate of composite primary endpoint was lower in the high-dose ARB group than in the ERB plus CCB group. I think Professor Shujai Ghosh will talk more about it. There was a significant treatment by subgroup interaction for the primary endpoints for the subgroup between cardiovascular disease and only the presence of diabetes. The OSCAR study, first large clinical trial to investigate the efficacy of combination of high dose ERB plus ERB plus CCB in high risk elderly hypertensive patients did not show any differences in reducing CV events or non CV deaths. ERB plus CCB was superior in reducing CV events or non-CV death in subgroup of patients with history of CV disease. High-dose ARB seemed to prevent CV events or non-CV events in patients with diabetes alone, in spite of the weakness in antihypertensive. <coughs> Further study is needed. Yes, sir, I have finished. Oscar study provides the first evidence showing that the standard dose of ARB plus CCB is superior to high dose ARP in reducing adverse events in elderly hypertensive with cardiovascular disease. Extremely relevant with our aging population. This is a comment by Sarah Silna from EWS, where in EWS alone, 11,000 baby boomers are turning 65 every day. I think Italy overtakes EWS in this respect. We definitely need a new study to examine whether ARP doubling or ARP plus CCP is good for diabetic hypertensive patients. Is agility pain superior to amberity? Just in my opinion, this is very early to predict about it. Though this is sponsored by agility different people, but we should not be biased. And uh, amberity pain has a much larger experience with several 36 years of experience with this molecule, amberity pain. And agility pain is relatively new, but very promising as you tell. And we need further randomized trials. Higher rate is a well-known predictor of CV mortality in Japanese patients when compared with AMLO, despite similar BP lowering effects, agile medicated patients have significantly lower heart rate, which is an added advantage. Agile nidipin reduces cardiac hypertrophy and remodeling more than amlo by a greater reduction of oxidative stress and inflammation. So this has got some good effect on the LV diastolic dysfunction and that is to be seen in future time that whether it becomes a drug of choice in patients with AP means heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So thank you very much for your kind and patient here. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Dhiman. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Dhiman has got over 30 years of experience in treating patients with cardiovascular disease. And he has given enough and more lectures in national and international forums, the guest lecture in Europe. And he has very clearly told us that this third generation new uh, azil niftepine is very good. It has got prolonged action, reduces the morning blood pressure, and then it reduces the heart rate. It is anti-anginal, it's an antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, good for the left ventricle, and a very good drug as a single dose in the morning, which definitely should bring down blood pressure. Combinations is always good and can be combined with any drug of the antihypertensive drugs, but the dose has to be reduced depending on how fast the blood pressure comes down. With this, we go on to the next speaker. We have Sujay Ghosh. He is an associate professor of endocrinology in Kolkata. Dr. Ghosh is a specialist in endocrinology and diabetes and is an executive editor of the Indian Journal of Endocrinology and Metabolism. And he will talk to us on diabetic metabolism and the prospective uh, role of cell in, in treating the patients with diabetes, hypertension, and the other endocrinological disorders. Dr. Ghosh, please.
thank you very much for that kind introduction hope i am audible yeah you are you are audible at okay. the very outset i would like to thank today's sponsors for having brought all of us together for this wonderful symposium and secondly i would thank professor matthew for that excellent introduction and overview of, of the topic wherein he's actually summarized the presentations of the all three of us i guess and of course dr dhiman kahali respected senior and teacher and colleague from kolkata for having given this wonderful overview as a result of which my job is much easier because most of what i intended to talk about has already been covered i will just try and highlight the metabolic aspects of this new molecule in the management of hypertension azelnitipin from an endocrinologist perspective to see how does this drug do in terms of people with hypertension with a background of metabolic dysfunction and diabetes so dr kahali has already mentioned to us what should be the targets of or the diagnostic criteria of hypertension it's no different in individuals with diabetes and that we as endocrinologists or diabetologists or physicians probably have a greater bias of using drugs related really, which work on the ras system that's pro probably because of individuals with diabetes with nephropathy however if somebody does not have nephropathy whether using a ras inhibitor to start with is perhaps more controversial in terms of the multifactorial risk intervention we realize that not only is hypertension management important but lipid management is also important according to the currently existing goals and of course glucose management so ideally as a doctor if we wanted a drug for the management of hypertension we would want a drug that would actually reduce morbidity and mortality should be a drug which is long acting therefore should be given once a day for the reasons that dr kahali explained that you know there's a morning surge of blood pressure leading to rise of cardiovascular events in the morning so he talked about the concept of reverse chronotherapy and the drug should be relatively cheap affordable potent well tolerated with minimal side effects and you should be able to give it to maximum proportion of people with minimal interactions so evidence based combination therapy because that's one of the things that dr kahali stopped with he was talking about combining two drugs rather than up titrating a uh, arb or an ac inhibitor and the kind of combination that we can think of is the ones that is highlighted here and probably i'll be talking more of the combination of the ras blockade with the calcium channel blocking and what's the rationality of using a calcium channel blocker with an arb particularly in individuals with diabetes so if you look at each of these group of drugs have their own pluses and minuses so if you look at a calcium channel blocker we are worried about it having peripheral edema and this is a group of drug that works by causing arteriolar dilatation is effective in low end in hypertension and reduces cardiac ischemia but because of the venodilatation it there could be problems and the arb causes ras blockade and is beneficial in patients with congestive heart failure and has renal outcome benefits the reason for which we you tend to use it in diabetic individuals the ccps on the other hand in general cause ras activation that's conventional calcium channel blockers uh, without any definitive role in renal or cardiovascular heart failure outcomes so if we combine the two groups of drugs can we actually yield more benefit compared to the individual groups of drugs the other thing that we all often now talk about is starting with a combination therapy instead of one drug to start with and this is one of the algorithms which tell us if your initial blood pressure is more than 150 systolic you're probably justified in combining or starting with two medications at one go but again like dr kahali mentioned that you some of the particularly newly diagnosed hypertensive individuals might be exquisitely be sensitive we even one drug so start slow go slow but one of the things that you could do if you are choosing a combination initial therapy is an as or arb to be combined with either a calcium channel blocker or diuretic i will try and highlight in this talk the importance of perhaps combining the as arb with a calcium channel blocker rather than a diuretic and 
the next step would be to add the other agent that is if you had used the combination of arb and ccp now go and add a diuretic if even that doesn't work then you go on adding spironolactone and then you come to the stage of resistant hypertension and of course let's not forget our good old friend the beta blocker which professor matthew talked about was was the reason why a nobel prize was given away but beta blockers you've got to remember is a group of drugs which specifically could be used at any stage for certain particular indications including heart failure angina post myocardial infarction atrial fibrillation or young women with a planning pregnancy so with regards to the calcium channel blockers and the kidneys dr matthew highlighted one of the points that this is a group of this is a particular molecule which works both on the l and the t types of calcium channels as a result of which the intraglomerular pressure goes down and that's probably the mechanism through which this might be beneficial in patients with kidney disease and intraglomerular hypertension something very well highlighted in the introductory bit with regards to metabolic syndrome and the ro role of azelmitipin in individuals with metabolic syndrome this is one study of called the agen study let's look at this very interesting study this is in individuals who do not have diabetes and let us look at what metabolic changes happen if you use this drug compared to amlodipine and remember this is a, a study which is a crossover study i'll go straight to the study design and come back again to this particular slide it's a small study of 17 people without diabetes wherein you had azelmitipine 16 mg per day versus 5 mg of amlodipine so it's an observational period where you have a washout time people who were on amlodipine they are randomized either to azelmitipine or amlodipine after a 12 week period there is a crossover so the ones who were getting azelmitipine now get amlodipine and vice versa and as you can see these individuals had their blood pressures checked their heart rates checked something which has been highlighted both by the chairperson as well as the spe previous speaker because one of the things that amlodipine tends to do is increase heart rates and you also looked at blood and urine samples and you've done a 20 uh, 75 gram glucose oral glucose tolerance test and you've looked at certain inflammatory markers as well so if you look here the ones that are circled out there if you look the highly sensitive crp the interleukin 6 these are two things that are definitely lower in azelmitipine telling you at least as far as inflammation is concerned this drug does better than amlodipine and there is something else in terms of the hemopoietic progenitor cells which is again a marker telling you about the inflammatory markers it is lower in azelmitipine compared to amlodipine this is the baseline characteristics of the patients that we talked about and here again if you look here the blood pressure control was similar in azelmitipine compared to amlodipine but the heart rate was significantly lower in the azelmitipine compared to amlodipine so same blood pressure reduction but the heart rate is different and we are all aware one of the predictors of mortality is your heart rate so if you have a lower heart rate you're probably going to do better as a patient and if you look at the glucose tolerance test results the glucose levels at the end of 2 hours and if you look at the insulin levels as a marker of insulin sensitivity patients who are on azelmitipine they had lower glucose levels and they had lower insulin levels telling us from a metabolic point of view this drug was better than amlodipine in reducing insulin sensitivity and improving glucose tolerance so next moving on to the same agent study to look at endothelial function you can see we've already pointed out that the glucose tolerance was better insulin sensitivity was better inflammatory state was better and you had fewer number of hemopoietic progenitor cell in non diabetic patients with essential hypertension telling us that even though endothelial function did not improve if you are going to reduce these number of progenitor cell then the fibrotic process and the ill effects of endovascular damage that happens due to hypertension is probably going to be lower in the long run with this particular agent and in terms of the side effect profile there was nothing much to choose between the two but this drug was not associated with reflex tachycardia 
as is the case with amlodipin. So very different from amlodipin as far as that goes. Now, this is again another study, but this time in individuals with diabetes. And this study looks at plasma aldosterone levels and plasminogen activator inhibitor level one. Now, we are aware that increased level or activation of the RAS and plasma aldosterone level is associated with increased left ventricular dysfunction, fibrosis, and increased cardiovascular mortality, even if your blood pressure is controlled. So for example, someone with Kohn syndrome with hypertension, the same level of blood pressure if an individual has with essential hypertension, the individual with Kohn syndrome will have a worse cardiovascular outcome. And we are aware that a lot of these antihypertensive agents that we use actually activate the RAS system, including traditional conventional calcium channel blockers. Now, therefore, even though you might be doing well in terms of hypertension control, the long-term cardiovascular benefit might not be there because of the reflex activation of the RAS system. So this drug, when it was used, the plasma aldosterone concentration and plasma uh, pi-1 level concentration were not increased. In fact, they were decreased with no significant changes in systolic blood pressure, mean arterial blood pressure, and diastolic blood pressure compared to other calcium channel blockers that was used. So something which is good in terms, we hope would translate into cardiovascular benefits. What about anti-atherosclerotic effect? Something that was being pointed out by the chairperson in the beginning of the session itself. So this is again a study comparing aslindipine with amlodipine to look at what happens to urinary albumin excretion and carotid intima media thickness also looking at MCP1 levels and TNF alpha levels, which are cytokines, which reflect the level of inflammation in the body. These are all surrogate markers because we do not have long-term outcome study data. We have to go by these surrogate markers. And what is clearly shown is that the blood pressure reduction is similar, but in terms of the heart rate, as clearly discussed, even in the previous studies, amlodipine at a higher heart rate and in terms of the urinary albumin excretion, azelinidipin, there was improvement, probably because it acts through both the L and the T types of calcium channel at the level of the glomerulus. The MCP1 and TNF alpha levels were lower, and the carotid intimal thickness was lower in the BOT2 study with azelinidipin compared to amlodipin. And this is again something that Dr. Kahali was trying to talk about in terms of left ventricular relaxation this drug doing better as compared to the other follower comparator drug to show that this is good in terms of the left ventricular diastolic function as well and left ventricular relaxation. So that's there. So that's the salient points. If I summarize, azelnidipin offers 24 hours smooth blood pressure control, including double digit control. It has got superior sympathetic nerve activity reduction compared to amlodipine. There is no reflex tachycardia. It reduces proteinuria by the mechanisms explained. Probably in the long run should improve renal outcomes. It has got an anti-inflammatory antioxidant property, improves endothelial dysfunction and arterial stiffness because of the mechanisms that I showed in terms of reducing the number of progenitor hematopoietic stem cell production. This reduction of the B-type natriuretic peptide, which Dr. Kahali already mentioned, and therefore can probably be better in terms of people with heart failure. In terms of insulin resistance and glucose tolerance, it improves. And that should be in line with the uric acid level, which is also a part of the metabolic syndrome and exhibits cardioprotection as I already explained. The neuroprotection bit is going to be talked about by the next speaker and is relatively well controlled. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Thank you very much, Dr. Sujoy. It is a wonderful lecture and you have gone through not only endocrinology, but cardiology, nephrology, everything you have discussed. Very good. And the salient points which you have shown at the end is very important to remember that it has a glucose tolerance protection. It reduces the requirement of insulin. The control of hyperuricemia is also very much better. And it has got an anti-fibrotic, anti-inflammatory effect. 
and in in metabolic syndrome also is useful so thank you so much for uh, elaborating giving full light of the drug on the various parts of the body and how uh, one should view as a very good single uh, drug dose to be given along with the uh, other conventional drugs you said that the combination can be used in diabetes to control the bp is very we find it very difficult to control the bp in the diabetics but a combination of the new drug along with arbs it is wonderful so that bp can be brought down to 130 systolic and about 80 to 90 diastolic thank you very much uh, dr sujay we'll wait for the questions and answers later on next we go on to the next speaker that is uh, dr uh, chaurasya dr chaurasya is uh, head of department of neurology at the bsu in varanasi and he had more than 55 publications in various national and international journals and he is going to talk to us on the role of uh, the azelnipine in post ischemic strokes uh, dr chaurasya please thank you chairperson sir for your nice words uh, first i would like to thanks the organizers uh, who have given the opportunity to speak something this new uh, it's not a new molecule it's a older one but nowadays it's a custom to uh, at least use as much as possible this new molecule so i will thanks organizer for this opportunity cme conduction where my job is now easy because uh, already the two learned speakers have spoken uh, the about the molecules the their properties related with the cardio protective effects and you know protective effects and the uh, complications related with the uh, diabetes complications uh, micro and microvascular complications diabetes causing and the benefit of this molecules so can you share my slide i should start sharing so the topic provided Uh, me for speaking is the management of hypertension in strokes so the stroke is in regarding the my presentation on the following topic stroke little bit about stroke etiology what are the risk factors which are very important to uh, deal with this uh, strokes what are the primary prevention to uh, stop the strokes and uh, what are the secondary preventions and what are the drugs to be used to uh, treat the hypertension in primary or secondary uh, treatment a few points regarding the technology of the stroke in india uh, there are various uh, uh, studies but i will like to uh, read about the uh, as systemic review which was a population based and uh, they have uh, gathered the information of 50 years of stroke treatment in our country where they have shown that the cumulative incidence of stroke that is ranging from 105 to 150 per lakh persons per year and the crude prevalence was from 44 around uh, 44 to 559 per lakh persons and you can see the burden of this uh, uh, disease in the our society and uh, ischemic stroke is most common when compared to the hemorrhagic stroke and we know that around uh, 80% is ischemic and rest are the hemorrhagic and subarachnoid and this uh, prevalence and incidence is increasing day by day you can see this graph we have shown that uh, in the it was around 19% in 2001 to 3 reports and it's increasing around 36% in uh, by the 2030 so the you can see the burden of stroke in india and uh, the case fatality rate it's a, uh, i can say uh, overall even in the india and the world this is the second leading cause of death or mortality
I think the connection was. Hello. 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 Uh, sorry for the interruptions. Uh, the internet connection was lost. Sorry for that. And uh, uh, See that there are the uh, 28 days post stroke disabilities in Indian cities. Studies is uh, shown that there are, we can see mild more in the moderate rate of severity. And the uh, MRS score after this is also further in the. Uh, There appears to be some disruption in uh, Prof. Chaurasia's uh, uh, talk. Can I, can I suggest something that, you know, the slides are projected from elsewhere and he turns off his video and actually speaks only on the audio. He's got bad bandwidth. Dr. Chaurasia, if the slides can be shared from the organizers yeah, 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 again. and if you could turn off your video and then talk. I think then it'll and you can say next next it'll oh. be easier because turn off your video. Okay, I have turned it. Bad, bad bandwidth. Turned off. And yeah, now on. now now share your screen and try your slides once again. Sure. Great. Uh, sorry okay. for the disturbances. The I'm audible. You are. Yes, sir. You're audible. And uh, as you can see, there are the common risk factors and the, like hypertension, diabetes, smoking, and dyslipidemia. And uh, out of this, uh, very big risk factors. So I will speak about the how to uh, manage uh, uh, or prevent the strokes or after a stroke, how to uh, uh, prevent the recurrent strokes by controlling this hypertension. The, there are, as we know, there are very poor public awareness and inadequate infrastructure, especially in the government hospitals. And that's why they are the, uh, day by day increasing the uh, mortality as well as the morbidity due to this disease. And uh, presently there are the prevention of stroke is the best option considering the Indian scenario through the control or avoiding the risk factors as mentioned above. Uh, the management of hypertension uh, stroke, as we know the association between hypertension and stroke is the direct cause, uh, causal relationship. And the pre-hypertension as defined by the systolic blood pressure on 20 to 139 millimeter mercury at diastolic blood pressure, as all we know. Uh, when there is a reduction of 12 to 13 millimeter of mercury in, uh, in the solid blood pressure, the percentage stroke we can produce is around 37%. Uh, 
and it ranges up to the 42 percent in the uh, other studies. So there, the reduction in blood pressure is associated with reduced the reduced risk uh, stroke risk, and all hypertensive medications uh, have a similar effect in lowering the stroke risk. Whether it's a beta blocker, ARB, or whatever the calcium channel blockers, so there is no difference in the uh, uh, properties of the uh, of uh, there are the properties of all these antihypertensives. When there is the reduction, the degree of reduction in uh, BP is the main uh, causing uh, factors to reduce the stroke percentages. Now the general guidelines uh, have defined uh, the populations of different uh, less than 60 and older, uh, more than 16 years, and there uh, the guidelines when to start the treatment all such type of patients and adults with the diabetes are CKT. So NCA gives leniency to the elderly. Also it increases systolic cutoff from 130 millimeter to 140, citing evidence from recently conducted randomized control trials and meta-analysis. And there is a sprint trial which came later found that reducing systolic goal to less than 120 millimeter of mercury will significantly reduce cardiovascular mortality. And these findings of a sprint trial have been incorporated in uh, 2017 EHA guidelines published. And uh, the car trial and sprint trial are the two landmark trials to, uh, uh, for the primary prevention of the stroke. And in a car trial, uh, there were the lot uh, around uh, of 5,000 patients and uh, patients were adults with the diabetes mellitus while divided in intensive group and control group. And in intensive group, there was the systolic blood pressure was kept less than 120 millimeter mercury. While in control group, systolic blood pressure was kept between 120 to 1 mercury. And the outcome measures were taken the myocardial infarctions, non-fatal stroke, death from cardiovascular uh, events. And similarly, the sprint trial where they have, uh, took around 10,000 patients and the patients were non-diabetic adults with systolic blood pressure than 130 millimeter mercury. And the intensive uh, group uh, BP were kept uh, less than 120 millimeter mercury and control group uh, also kept less than uh, 120 million. And the outcome measures were uh, similarly myocardial infarction, non fatal stroke, death from cardiovascular events. And the results in, of the CAR trial was there was no significant difference in the composite outcome uh, regarding the MI in death from cardiovascular events. While there was the annual rate of stroke was significantly decreased in the intensive group in comparison to the control group. While in the SPR, the primary composite outcome, like in intensive control group, there were the 1.65% uh, in comparison to the standard group, 2.19%, uh, which was uh, statistically significant. And uh, there was uh, uh, a stroke was six, uh, uh, there were more uh, Side effects profile was more, adverse events were more in intensive group uh, uh, as compared to the uh, standard group in cases of a car trial, but there was no difference shown in the sprint trials. So these were the landmark trials for the primary prevention of the and uh, already have shown uh, the normal uh, values were uh, 120 to uh, and less than 8 millimeter stoli. Uh, Prehypertensive stage 1 and stage 2 account, according to the, the treatment uh, goal. So, the hypertension has been discussed. The card and these are the two uh, major landmark trials on the basis of which there are multiple changes occurred. In the
Halo. Hello. Sir, you are audible. You are audible, sir. I'm audible. You can continue. Okay, thank you. You can continue, sir. There are cloudy weather, so my, I think the internet is also a little bit better. Hello. 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 Uh, sorry for the disturbances. I think you have to share your screen once again, and uh, you can resume your presentation. Hello. Am I audible? Yeah, you are audible. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Uh, <laughs> so the uh, how uh, in a, a case it's and uh, control the hypertension in, in cases of acute stroke. First, you have to uh, uh, stroke a human. Um, I think would you be able to correct that uh, defective transmission? Please check if you can correct that transmission. Yes, sir. We are trying to contact uh, Dr. Chorasi and see if he can share his presentation with us. We can run that presentation on his behalf, as suggested by Dr. Ghosh. Mm -hmm. So, sorry for the trouble. Just give give us a moment. हेलो कनेक्शन इज पियर जियो से नहीं हो रहा है मैं तीनों चारों लगा लिए हेलो यस डॉक्टर चौरसिया वी कैन हियर यू बट या वी सजेस्ट इफ यू कैन शेयर द प्रेजेंटेशन वी विल रन इट फ्रॉम आवर एंड सो दैट देयर इज नो इंटरप्शन सो शुड आई सेंड on mail or yeah you can just send it on mail i'll uh, you can see your chat screen okay. i'll send you the email id on your chat screen my email id to share sure. i shared my email id on the chat screen sir to you privately you can just send that in your in my email id i'll put it up on screen on your behalf
Dr. Jorosia, did you get my email ID? Yes, I'm doing. Yeah, okay, okay perfect. There are four connections in my home, but all is very slow. No, why? Oh, oh, you can display the presentation which uh, we had sent to sir. Yeah, it's the same presentation. I think sir has made some changes in that presentation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can. Dr. Chaurasia, can I put that up on screen on your behalf? Have you sent it to me or how is it? Still, I am unable to compose it. Okay. Uh, I have that presentation, but I don't have the edited slides that you have done from your end. Is that uh, what can I put up? Basically, I have edited all. <laughs> okay. I will try again by... Okay, okay. Uh, Dr. Chaurasio, can you talk uh, without the slides? I'm not sure, sir. I think we have lost him. If, if, if Dr. Matthews suggests we can take the questions in the meantime and wait for I Sorry, think that will be better, you know, you, we I can think, take the questions. Yeah. I think before that, before that, we'll call uh, uh, Dr. Mayura to come and uh, talk about the uh, salient points about the drug. After that, we'll take up questions. Is that Dr. Mayuresh or Dr. Sharma that we spoke about? Which one, whom do you want us to connect to? Anyone, anyone of them. Dr. Deepak Sharma or Dr. Mayura can... Okay. I'll try to get Dr. Deepak Sharma online till that time. Dr. Mayuresh, if you have anything to share with the audience, please. Go ahead. Okay. 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 Okay.
Dr. Mayuresh, can you hear us? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. I think sir have shared the screen. So Dr. Chaurasi will continue. Okay. So you have, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, you are audible. Please go yes. ahead. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Thank you. Very Thank good. You for, yeah. So in ischemic stroke, we all know that there's a penumbra region, uh, which is very important and salvageable area. So uh, you must uh, be very careful. Uh, particularly in the early stage, you can save this penumbra region and the, you can save the uh, millions of neurons and that's why the, if there's an increased BP might be a driving force which helps to maintain adequate perfusion of penumbra region through the multiple collaterals and if there's an acutely lowering uh, BP may cause decreased perfusion in this penumbra region and this will change to the uh, complete uh, cessation of blood supply and will change the uh, ischemic region into the infarct zones. So you will lose the major part of the brain volume. Thus, along the blood pressure in higher range, at least initially, is thought to protect the, this penumbra region. But in stroke, the increased blood pressure may be deleterious, particularly on when the risk of re-bleeding re is very high. And so the rapid correction of elevated vapor is recommended in cases of hemorrhage too. Similarly, in the subarachnoid hemorrhage, which presents uh, a unique challenges in that early risk of re-bleeding is followed by chances of ischemia due to the vessel path. So the blood pressure must be diligently followed and adequately controlled according to the time since the hemorrhage. And the patients presenting with the acute stroke, acute ischemic stroke, you have to uh, dichotomize into those uh, who are eligible for thrombolysis and those who are not. Those who are uh, eligible for the thrombolysis, their blood pressure is more than 185 and 110. You have to bring it to less than 185 to 110 before thrombolysis. And after that, their BP should be of less than 180 and under five limit of mercury for at least 24 hours. And this is based on expert opinion, observational studies and exploration of the data from cardiac thrombolysis uh, studies. And thus the lowering of the BP to lower target did not result in improved functional outcome, though they were associated with lesser hemorrhagic transformation. And the BP should be controlled with easily titrable agents without subjecting patients to sudden BP fluctuations. And there is no urgent, urgency to treat elevated BP in cases of ischemic stroke patients due to the beneficial effect of hypertension in protection of penumbra region. And treat only if the, the BP is more than 220 by 120 millimeter of mercury are associated with other conditions 
such as ischemic heart disease, heart failure, aortic dissection, hypertensive encephalopathy, or eclampsia. And if the treatment is indicated, BP should be brought down slowly in acute stage with a triterable IV agent. And there should not be more than 50 to 20% reduction in the first 24 hours of the patients. And in contrast to the ischemic stroke, blood pressure can be rapidly lowered in cases of hemorrhagic stroke. And the two landmark trials, Interact 2 and the Attach 2 trials, which have evidence that BP can be lowered rapidly and systolic BP maintained in range of, in the range of 140 to 180 millimeter of mercury, which is also endorsed by the Ministry of uh, Family and Health Welfare, Government of India. And according to the uh, ministry guideline, if the systolic blood pressure is more than 200 millimeter mercury, aggressive treatment with parenteral hypertensive should take place. And if systolic BP is more than 180 millimeter mercury, use of oral medication is indicated. In the target systolic BP should be in range of 140 to 150 millimeter mercury at least seven days, uh, not less than that. So the silent features of interact to and attached to, as we know, the uh, in the interact trial there were around 3,000 patients, and in attached two trial there were around 1,000. Uh, patients. So the silent features, uh, main result was there were in cases of intensive, uh, the patients were divided uh, into the intensive and control group and in intensive group, the BP was kept below 140 millimeter mercury systole uh, within one hour and in systole uh, uh, control group, the BP was kept between 140 to 179, uh, uh, 180 millimeter mercury. And the outcome was measured what death or measured disability, which were defined by the modified red key scale, a score of three to six. And the results in the interact two trial was there were 52% receiving, in cases of intensive group treatment, 52% receiving uh, compared with the 55.6% receiving standard guideline treatment had a primary outcome event. And that was around, uh, uh, in the favor of intensive, uh, not uh, very significant between the two groups. And the ordinal analysis showed significantly lower modified ranking scales with the intensive intensive treatments. And the mortality was around 11.9% in the group receiving intensive treatment and around 12% in the group rece receiving standard guideline. And there were non-fatal serious events, adverse events occurred in uh, near about same in the, both the groups. In attached group, the primary outcome of death or uh, death or disability was observed in around more or less in similar and that was also not significant. Uh, well, uh, the serious adverse events also were reported near about the same percentage. And the rate of renal adverse events within seven days after randomization was significantly higher in the intensive group in comparison to the standard group in cases in attached to trial. The hypertension control treatment in cases of acute subarachnoid embrace, uh, there are uh, the, based on the few clinical evidences, like the observational studies, they have suggested that aggressive treatment of BP may reduce the risk of aneurysmal rebleeding, but with an increased risk of secondary ischemia. So, and the guidelines from different clinical societies agree that it is reasonable to treat BP if the aneurysm is not at secure, although the level of BP reduction recommended in the guideline differs. And the American Stroke Association recommends it should be less than 160 milliliter of mercury, systole blood pressure, while ESO found moderate quality evidence to support weak recommendations for intensive lowering of systole blood pressure to less than. 140 millimeter mercury within six hours of ICH stroke onset. Few points regarding the secondary uh, prevention in cases of uh, uh, stroke. A systemic review done by the Catsons et al., which have collected the data, uh, uh, mostly the randomized control trial. The, like the studies like the whole progress, progress, scope, SPSS, S3, they have shown that 
anti hypertensive treatment was associated with lower risk for recurrent stroke and cardiovascular death both and the subgroups of the patients reported to achieve mean systolic blood pressure of less than 130 mm as we said had lower prevalence of recurrent strokes compared with the subgroup with systolic blood pressure range between 130 and 140 mm mercury and systolic blood pressure more than 140 mm similarly in the subgroup analysis of reported outcomes according to the mean level of achieved diastolic blood pressure subgroups of patients reported to achieve mean diastolic blood pressure of less than 85 had a significantly lower prevalence of recurrent stroke as compared to the more than 85 and 90 mm mercury so the ministry have already uh, uh, set the guidelines the bp should maintain below 130 by 190 uh, 130 by 90 mm mercury and for the patient the same small vessel ischemic stroke lowering the systolic blood pressure less than 130 mm mercury may reduce the risk of a future intracerebral hemorrhage and in the patients with the hemodynamically significant large artery disease blood pressure lowering should be used cautiously as tolerated without a specific goal other than a minimum reduction of 10 of systolic and 5 of diastolic mm mercury around and in the patients who develop recurrent neurologic symptoms preferable to stenotic artery when the bp is lowered below a threshold the suggested minimum is to maintain bp above that should so the bp targets for stroke prevention as we can see in a, uh, a single slide the less than 130 by 80 mm for those with the diabetes mellitus or ckd patients and those having uncomplicated hypertension we can keep below 140 by 90 mm mercury and those having the recent lacrimal stroke uh, lacrimal strokes for secondary prevention we can keep below 130 by 80 mm mercury and uh, this so the approach how we can approach uh, to prevent the primary prevention or secondary prevention of uh, management of hypertension in acute stroke so divide first ischemic hemorrhagic subarachnoid and then divide the ischemic whether it's uh, eligible for thrombolysis or not if eligible then bring the dp less than 185 by 110 mm mercury 105 mm mercury and after thrombolysis keep below 180 by 15 105 uh, mm mercury for at least 24 hours if it's not eligible for thrombolysis then treat only if more than 220 by 120 mm mercury like this and as we have discussed in cases of hemorrhagic if the bp is more than 200 mm mercury systolic give the iv medication if more than 180 mm mercury systolic give the oral drugs titrate drug to keep systolic bp between 140 to 180 mm systolic and preferably between 140 to 150 mm mercury systolic and in subarachnoid hemorrhage try to keep around 130 to 140 mm mercury in cases of subarachnoid hemorrhage the primary prevention we have already discussed the gnc record and spectral uh, suggest you keep the systolic blood pressure of less than 120 and uh, diastolic less than 80 mm mercury if the patient is able to tolerate and in the secondary prevention keep less than 140 mm and 90 mm mercury diastolic and our ministry and uh, health and family welfare guidelines say keep 130 by 90 mm mercury we can say uh, as i already told you that uh, there are uh, if you are bringing the systolic blood pressures of around 10 to 12 mm mercury there is a large uh, benefit around 30 to 42% reduction in the stroke rate by bringing only this much of uh, systolic blood pressures only we can prevent the recurrent or the stroke occurrence by decreasing this level of uh, uh, blood pressures by any means whatever the drugs we are using 
So the choice of antihypertensive to prevent the recurrent stroke, uh, risk of recurrent stroke is heightened by the presence of elevated BP. So reduction is very uh, in the blood pressure is very important. And meta-analysis have already randomized control trials uh, showed that uh, there is 30 to 40 percent reduction of stroke with BP management. And if diuretic and inhibitor, AS inhibitor or ARB treatment do not achieve BP target, then add another agent such as calcium channel blockers or beta blockers, etc. So uh, this slide we have already discussed by Dr. Suzor. So, there are various other uh, uh, meta-analysis and meta regression analysis uh, which have shows that the calcium channel blocker and ACE inhibitors, diuretics and beta adrenergic blockers can decline the incidence of stroke in hypertensive population. And among them, the calcium channel blockers reduce uh, the stroke more than the placebo and beta adrenergic blockers, but were not different than the ACE inhibitor and diuretics. So this is a very large population included in this uh, meta-analysis. So you can see that by uh, reducing this uh, greater risk of reduction was observed in trials with the highest pre-treatment diastolic BP, if there's more than 95 millimeter mercury, likely due to more intensive treatment in these trials. And their uh, relative risk reduction was around 0.54. Similarly, the results observed for higher pre-treatment systolic BP, if the systolic BP is more than 170, there is also very significant uh, relative risk reduction, around 42% spaces in stroke recurrence. Uh, already we have heard the, this uh, molecule of uh, azelnodipin, which is a third generation passive channel blockers, and the mode of action acts on mainly the L type and T type of uh, calcium channel block uh, calcium channels and the, the, the different properties of this drug by acting different type of ch uh, channels so the on the heart sympathetic nervous system uh, renal effect and the adrenal so we have already discussed there are various uh, methods we can drug is acting. so it's a uh, uh, having the antioxidant properties, anti-inflammatory properties, anti-atherosclerotic uh, plaque progressions, uh, and uh, uh, by reducing the LV uh, uh, mass and increasing the uh, this uh, ejection fractions, and by decreasing the renal uh, hypertension. So there are various mechanism. Uh, look for the neuroprotective. Uh, as we know, it's a long acting calcium channel blocker and is highly lipid soluble and has a higher selectivity for the vascular wall than the older generation calcium channel blockers. And the blood flow to the brain was significantly increased in animal models that were treated with adrenaline and is expected to have an increasing effect on cerebral blood flow due to the uh, vasodilatation. And the antihypertensive therapy itself may induce the risk of ischemic brain complications by a decrease in cerebral blood flow. And many studies have shown that different calcium channel blockers have different effects on cerebral blood flow. And uh, however, the other long acting calcium channel blockers such as amylodipine show no improvement in the calcium channel blocker. There are several mechanisms proposed and some are uh, claimed and some are proved uh, with this uh, blood flow of uh, after treatment with the adrenaline The primary effect is the vasodilatation by uh, affecting the L-type voltage-dependent calcium channel blockers. Similarly to the other long-lasting diatropyridine uh, calcium channel blockers, such as amylodipine and benedipine, it may also shift the lower limits of cerebral blood flow autoregulations in the direction of a lower blood pressure by changing the cerebral resistance of the vessels. And the adrenaline enhance the endothelial nitric oxide synthesis activity uh, level in the brain. So the, the vasodilatory effect of nitric oxide that exerts anti-inflammatory, anti-thrombotic, anti-apoptotic, and anti-proliferative actions. And there are various, uh, various uh, mechanisms of action proposed and proved. 
uh, of this adenylidipine molecule and that's how it protects the cerebral circulation by increasing endothelial nitric oxide production and the finally adenylidipine has more liquid soluble and selectivity for the vascular wall than any other older generation was reported that he been involved in the normalization of the disautoregulation disautoregulation of the cerebral circulation and the third sympathetic nervous system which increases during hypertension not only contributes to the adjustment to circulatory stress but also to a sustained increase in vascular resistance and arterial process so there are <coughs> various mechanisms uh, that is uh, effective and it's a uh, protective for both cardiac uh, uh, cardiovascular systems uh, renal systems as well as the neuroprotective effect so uh, it's a generally well tolerated in clinical trials and uh, not associated with any reflex tachycardia it's another good property in, in comparison to the amlodipine and uh, most of the adverse effects of this drug is due to the uh, Uh, its effect of vasodilatation, and the most common adverse effect in clinical trials reported were headache, hot facial flushes, and lightheadedness. We have already discussed this uh, various silent features of these molecules, out of which it exhibits the cardioprotective, neuroprotective, and renoprotective effects, and lessens the uh, incidences of pleural edema. Uh, And it's a well tolerated drug, so I think uh, we have already discussed the various combinations of drugs of this uh, adenylidipine along with uh, uh, ARB as inhibitors and all this. So I would like to end the talk here. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me, sir? Yeah, yeah. Matthew, sir. Can can hear you? Yes. Go ahead. So that's all from our side. Uh, so there are some questions uh, to take up. Yes, sure. Yeah. Uh, so there is question for Dr. Sujay uh, Ghosh. The question is: Could you please elaborate the role of azelidipine in patients who are diagnosed as pre-diabetics? Right. We do not have any definitive trial of, you know, of the drug in a subset of individuals with pre-diabetes. But I think I've shown you two different studies: one in individuals who do not have diabetes, and another in individuals who do have diabetes. In both of them, it is clearly demonstrated. that insulin resistance is improved glucose tolerance is improved so even though we do not have a dedicated study on pre diabetic subjects it might seem imperative that if you have an individual with pre diabetes and if that individual is hypertensive the use of this drug is probably justified in the fact that at least it will not worsen metabolic control whether it will truly translate into improvement or delaying of conversion of pre diabetes to diabetes is anybody's guess dr sujo you had a question uh, one of the persons have asked what is the role uh, of the acetylcholine on the metabolism of aldactone on on the metabolic could you repeat please i couldn't hear you properly on metabolic of aldactone aldactone of spironolactone yeah okay so uh, i am not aware of any drug interactions that happen directly but one of one of the things that we were talking about when we were talking about the management algorithm of hypertension per se we were talking about that in a diabetic individual your probably first line drug is an ace inhibitor or an arb that's predominantly because of the data of the nephropathy benefit not necessarily the other benefits 
and dr kahali quite clearly showed that instead of doubling the dose of an arb it might well be that you combine a arb with a calcium channel blocker might result in better benefit and it's only after that you add another diuretic if that doesn't work only then you go on to a spironolactone okay there's a question to uh, dr uh, hali that uh, what is the relation between the heart rate and the myocardial infarction or myocardial damage uh, see there is uh, no as such you know if somebody has myocardial infarction we always try to keep the heart rate around 55 to 60 not only myocardial infarction but even patients with stable coronary artery disease to reduce the demand of the myocardium we want to keep the rate lower of course we have to give beta blocker for this purpose because after studying the drug through all the available small small studies we show we have seen that the reduction in heart rate is only minus 2 from the baseline heart rate so it's not much but uh, you know as sujay professor sujay ghosh has also told and i also told in my lecture that there is a relationship between the heart rate and mortality in all individuals like presence of complete left bundle branch block in the ecg even if the ejection fraction is good if a person has lvv in the ecg his lifespan is going to be shorter than a person who has no lvv similarly if a person has a heart rate resting 90 then it is his longevity is going to be less than a person with a heart rate of 90 we know about all these features so we prefer drugs which do not increase the you know heart rate rather it decreases the heart rate a little and of course uh, you know taking into consideration the lv systolic function effect of that particular drug like in uh, patients with reduced ejection fraction we cannot use diltiazem or verapamil because those are also calcium blockers and their uh, reduction in heart rate uh, is much more significant than these molecules so amlodipine is almost neutral but it increases the heart rate a little bit as evident from the studies but adilinidipine is good in that sense that it does not increase and rather it decreases the heart rate a little so this is the you know in nutshell or summary the relation between heart rate and the cardiovascular health so the acelidipine is uh, quite good because it reduces the heart rate yeah. very nice and uh, as uh, dr shaurasi was telling the importance of uh, the drug on the cerebral circulation has to be remembered because it doesn't reduce the blood flow to the brain the blood flow to the brain brain remains the same even though the blood pressure the system blood pressure gets controlled so it's a it's a neuroprotective uh, agent also Yeah. So we had uh, uh, we had heard from the three specialists very very important information regarding the new drug, which should be quite useful. You know? uh, as you know, the hypertension still continues to be a silent killer of human race, as W. H. Had put it across. You know, during the last century or this present century, important celebrities like Abdul Gamal Nazar, the, the King George the Sixth. Elvis Presley, the Rene Gozzini, all died in their young age because of severe hypertension. We are not forgetting Franklin Roosevelt, who did not get the treatment and died with the 300 by 190 blood pressure in 1945. So the importance of the present talk about the new drug is that we should all be aware of the correct control of blood pressure, as mentioned by the Indian standards as well as JNC8. and the new drug acelipine as hopefully and definitely is a promising drug to decrease the blood pressure have lesser side effects it easily accessible it is cheap and it has got significant effect on improving the target organ function and can be used along with other antihypertensive drugs any more questions please Yes, sir. There are a few questions that I have sent you to your chat box. If you can see, I have directly sent that on your chat box from the audience. Dr. Matthews, can you can you check your chat box? Pardon? Yeah. 
can you check your chat box? I've sent uh, forwarded few questions from the audience that has come to me. Those are being forwarded to you on your chat box. This is a question to uh, Dr. Sujay. Or Dr. Kahali can answer. Uh, we cannot see the chat box because the existing facility doesn't show it. Normally, it comes on the right-hand side of the panel, but here we are trying, but it's not coming. I think there is some problem. And uh, Shujai, can you see to it? The no, chat I box? can't. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, yes, are, yeah, we, are, we have opened it. Just let me see. Oh, again, it went out. Professor Matthew has to open it for us. You know, read out the questions for us. Yeah, there's a question. Uh, it's part, the, the first half is not seen. With amlodipine, which was presented by uh, Dr. Kahali, could you please tell us what precautions we need to ensure when we switch a calcium channel blocker and how important would be the 24-hour ambulatory BP monitoring in such patients? Uh, see, amlodipine is the one of the first choices like this molecule which also can be given uh, just talking about the you know calcium channel blockers amlodipine we have been using as a drug of first choice for last several decades and uh, it's a new molecule and the uh, results are fascinating and encouraging and uh, so we can use this molecule azovas or azelnidipine also but uh, regarding the other factors which you told that what we have to take care of other things Pedal edema is a problem in case of using amlodipine. So amlodipine in a dose of 5 milligrams normally produces not that much of pedal edema as it does in a dose of 10 milligrams. So we should be try to restrict the dose of amlodipine or other molecules in the lower one, not agilnidipine because the pedal edema effect of agilnidipine is lower than that of amlodipine. That we have learned from the several studies shown today in our discussion. So we can have a 16 milligram in patients who are having uh, pedal edema, we can give that one. Another way of reducing the pedal edema to add with telmisartan, because it has been seen that telmisartan and amlodipine, and now it's agilnidipine, we can reduce the pedal edema. And as such also, it has been shown that uh, the effects of pedal edema with the agilnidipine molecule is less than that of amlodipine. So these are the few things we want to tell. And uh, also one very good property uh, reduces the cardiovascular mortality as decreases the heart rate without causing bradycardia. No, it is not established. So if, I can't tell because there is not a lot of Evidence-based, I'm answering the next question, which is in the chat box. Agilindivine reduces the cardiovascular mortality as it decreases the heart rate without causing bradycardia. Uh, I can't tell that it's a true because we haven't got any evidence-based. For this, we have to have a large randomized trial, and I'd like the sponsors to have a uh, Indian trial so that because we have a lot of hypertensive patients, I think Professor Matthew will agree and Professor Ghos will also agree. So, uh, there's a question on uh, the reports of pedal edema in yeah. chances with acelipine. And as far as the reports go, there's not much of evidence for acelipine because it acts on both the L and T channels. Then there's a question about urinary albumin excretion, creatinine excretion as a parameter long term management. And it definitely reduces the urinary albumin excretion. It improves the glomerular filtration rate because both the afferent and efferent arteriole are dilated because the L and T uh, channels are blocked. So it is definitely a good drug uh, to reduce the proteinuria as well as to reduce, increase the GFR and good in case of chronic kidney disease. Yeah. Uh, one question to Dr. Sujay is there. Uh, that's about the use of uh, the drug in pre-diabetes. Sujay, please. I think I just answered that question, yeah, that, was answered that, question that I was asked. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Right. Any more questions? In the chat box, at least we cannot see any more questions. Uh, so only, think, only this much has come. Yeah, yeah. Only this so much has come. Two hours and we should conclude the meeting now. 
Thank you. All. Okay. Yeah. It's quite good. We have two more uh, people to talk to us. That is okay. either Dr. Deepak or Dr. Mayur. So there are a few more questions. Uh, Mayuresh, Dr. Mayuresh, yeah. can you please hold? Yeah, we yeah. have Dr. Deepak Sharma with us who wanted to just add a few points. Jay, can you please promote Dr. Deepak Sharma? Done, sir. Thank you. Dr. Sharma, can we hear from you? Yeah, please go ahead. Dr. Sharma, please unmute yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Loud and clear. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's good to see Sir Joy and Kino Zuman. Anyway, I think it's an excellent presentation by all the speakers. But I think, you know, I have all exhaustively uh, demonstrated all the findings. Practice is more cardiology than anything else. And I'd like to, I think, I think it's a very important molecule and promising molecule because we're all concerned about the left ventricular diastolic function as well as the ventricular, uh, you know, preserve ejection fraction, heart failure preserve ejection fraction. But possibly, just possibly, it might be a molecule which will be useful in this scenario. But all other things have been already explained. It has got anti anginal, anti inflammatory, good for diabetes, pre diabetes. Super Sujoy has very nicely explained. But there's one thing we're concerned about the left ventricular diastolic dysfunction and heart failure with preserved reduction fraction. Perhaps this molecule will be, you know, good molecule in the future with large studies will have some, you know, definite uh, figures and facts in the future. That's all I want to say. But all other things are very nice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Mayura, please. Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So there, are, sir there are a few questions. Like, uh, first question is, as Good you again. said, cardiology that lesser the heart rate, higher the cardiovascular mortality. So can we conclude that ozonolipin reduces the cardiovascular mortality as it decreases the heart rate? Without causing bradycardia, uh, I think, uh, I think we've yeah, answered all of these questions. Yeah. All of yeah. the questions in the chat yeah. box have I, been answered. I, I think it has been answered already. Okay, I, yeah, I, I, uh, we are good to continue, uh, uh, Matthews. If you can just uh, 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 now, uh, 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 hello. hello. Now we uh, we can conclude the session. Only one question is remaining uh, for the uh, moderator, sir, Dr. Matthews. Yeah. which has come from audience to answer you, sir. Since this molecule is reducing liver type fatty acid binding protein and 8-hydroxy-2-deoxyguanosine apart from proteinuria reduction and uh, serum creatinine reduction. So what is your view in terms of renal production of this molecule pertaining to liver type fatty acid binding protein and 8-hydroxy-2-deoxyguanosine, sir? Over to you, sir. After this, yeah. we can conclude the session. I've already told that it's definitely renoprotective because of the two mechanisms, very, very simple to easy to understand. It dilates the both the afferent and deferent arterioles of the glomerulus, and it definitely increases the glomerular filtration rate, it improves the GFR, the CKD is definitely coming down with the present method of medication. I think that should be sufficient. So we should close down with this nice uh, session on webinar. We, it has been organized by Messrs. JB Chemicals and Pharmaceuticals. I have to thank uh, everybody, including Varun and uh, Sanjeev, and also thank Dr. Diman Kahali, Dr. Sujay Ghosh, and uh, Dr. Chaurasya for the nice way in which they have explained in depth. I think anybody who has listened to it will understand how the drug was acting and how the importance of the drug uh, in the monotherapy or triple therapy or how it can improve the con situation of the patient care in the due course of time. Let us hope for the best and let us hope that this drug will, uh, even though it has been used in Japan since 2003, it is only coming to our country very shortly. So we hope it will have a good effect in our population also. Thank you very much for everybody. Thank you very much for the audience. Thank you very much for those who have asked questions. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, thank you, sir. We thank thank our... you, sir. Thank you. Thanks for Take our to the session. Today's session definitely have added to our knowledge about azalindipin, its place in therapy of hypertension. We hope to more such meeting in the future. Wish you a safe 
conclusion we ahead thank you Thank you.